Welcome back, everyone. We're here live in San Francisco for Amazon Web Services AWS Summit. It's a developer business training conference. It's kind of like a baby conference off Amazon reInvent, the big mother of all shows every year. This is the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract a signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Am. I'm joined by my co-host Jeff Frick, general manager of our Cube operations, filling in for Dave Vellante, who's traveling, watching not live on the mobile app. Dave, shout out to you. Mm -hmm. uh, our next guest is Pam Murphy, chief operating officer of Infor, um, one of the largest software companies in the world, top three or four, I think the numbers are for the leaderboard where you guys are at. Um, big announcement here at Amazon Web Services, enterprise software applications on the cloud. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's fantastic to see the news and great to have you on. I know your time's uh, very tight. Uh, so, Amazon has been criticized and for, and by us, first of all, we're big fans of Amazon customer, <laughs> but disclosure, we're a customer, but we've also criticized them on not really being enterprise ready. And that's what everyone has been throwing the FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, creating a lot of dissonance around Amazon's not ready for, their, for the prime time because IBM, Google, HP, <laughs> The list goes on and on of competitors who woke up to the fact that Amazon's ticking some serious butt yeah. in the cloud business. So you guys come in and do a deal. This is going enterprise. Yeah. So tell us, what's the big story with the announcement and how does that relate to the enterprise? So our, our announcement is about taking our very extensive broad suites uh, with deep industry functionality. It's been a central part of our strategy for many years to build out these very complete solutions so that customers don't have to customize their applications and therefore everything upgrades easy. Take the whole suite, put it on the cloud, put it on Amazon. And Amazon has been a, a fantastic partner for us to date. Uh, we, you know, the, they're global, which we are as well. We operate in, you know, we have over 150 offices globally. Uh, so we really needed a partner who was truly global in scale, who had that global network to rely on that was flexible, that was agile, and it's been fantastic to date. We have... Uh, and that's called Cloud Suite, right? That's called Cloud Suite, okay. yes. Um, to taking, you know, very complete suites for healthcare, we have a complete industry suite for hospitality, for aerospace and defense, for automotive, for public sector, uh, representing end-to-end -end business solutions for our customers uh, so that they can operate their entire mission critical applications on these suites and taking those and putting them into the cloud. So Jeff and I and Dave and Jeff Kelly and our other analysts, we always talk about the horses on the track. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, we mentioned some of the competition, but I really want to talk more about the concepts, the game-changing shifts. Obviously, SaaSification of business is something that's happening, right? Yeah. People are moving to a SaaS model, you're seeing the cloud wars around platform as a service. Um, all that's inside baseball for the cloud business, but you're out talking to customers, your customers, yeah. the cloud suite. What are the key things that they need and that they're looking for to be SaaSified? Have a software as a service business that they could use, one, to operate their business, but also their requirements for their customers, your customers' customers. What are the key things that they're looking for in the SaaS? In wow. the SaaS world? Well, uh, from, from an infrastructure perspective, let me start there. there. There's so much change happening all of the time that it's hard to keep up. And I guess with going in the cloud, they don't need to worry about that anymore. That's no longer their, their problem. Uh, there's also discussions on CapEx versus OpEx. From a customer perspective, you know, a lot of the time it's easier these days to get OpEx through rather than you know, do expensive capital uh, investments. Uh, they don't want to worry about upgrades. They want to make sure that they get the latest version of the applications all of the time. So for them, you know, this the cloud and, and SaaS and running their suites on the cloud, which we, they can do with us, means that you know, we're responsible for running of the system in conjunction with Amazon, so they're freed up to literally run their businesses. So we worry about the technology, they can work, worry about their businesses. And they now understand and see that it's very secure these days, which is an issue that I guess happened in the old days when people were less comfortable about how secure their applications were in the cloud. We are seeing a, a huge level of interest from our customers to move to the cloud. Um, uh, you know, you look at the analyst and they post, you know, these ratings about how quickly applications are moving and often you'll see applications like human capital management and financials are faster in moving to the cloud rather than the traditional mission critical ERP applications. But we are seeing a phenomenal amount of interest from our customers in terms of moving mission critical applications to the cloud as well. Um, 
so, you know, and it's far outpacing, I think, what the analysts are seeing as being the transition to the cloud. And is a lot of it net new business, or is it migrating existing kind of uh, traditional application it's, style into a cloud-based application? It's both. So uh, we're seeing a lot of net new interest in this area, but also, I mean, we have a huge base of 70,000 customers. Right, you don't want to uh, eat, eat all your own. Yeah. <laughs> you got a good revenue base there, right, based it, on it, those traditional exactly, applications. Exactly, but, but they, they are also now wanting to move to the cloud as well. Cloud as well. So we've created this program called UpgradeX, okay. and it's a way of helping our customers who have on-premise deployments today move their applications to the cloud in as fast and effective a way as possible. You know, we've invested a lot in automation. Um, you know, we can take these very complete and extensive suites that we've developed and provision them uh, in, in the cloud, in Amazon, in, in less than 30 minutes, compared to the weeks it would take to manually provision the same environment in an on-premise setting. Right, right. And we've implementation accelerators, industry-specific, which get customers up and running fast on the required configuration. So for customers, the benefit is they can get up and running fast on the latest version of the applications without having to worry about the infrastructure uh, and all the setup and configuration work uh, to, right, to enable right. them to get there. Well, then the, the other kind of classic issue opportunity with, with the SaaS model is the customizations, right? Yes. Because they do a lot of customizations. Yeah. That's fine if it's on-prem, but then you do an upgrade and what are the customizations and the hiccups? Exactly. So you do a SaaS application. You really can't do that many customizations because then you can't do a unified upgrade. So how has now moving a lot of your business or anticipating moving your business to the SaaS model changed your guys' delivery and ease of your being able to deliver the latest, greatest to your customers? And that's where we feel at Infor we, we have a big differentiator because we, one of the core tenets of our strategy has been to focus on industry specific suites and micro verticals. Our, our motto being, we don't want to create a generic software code base that is to be all things to all men. We'll focus on certain industries, certain micro verticals, and we will make sure that we build out the last mile of functionality so that customers don't have to customize their applications. So the beauty of our solution in these cloud suites is that when a customer moves to a cloud suite, um, you know, on, uh, the suite in the cloud, the functionality invariably is already there. Right. And the last 10% of it may, may be just configuration to enable them to get there. So the beauty of our, our strategy in, in pursuing that deep industry specific functionality means that customers invariably don't need to have to worry about uh, customizations, which means it's always easier to upgrade and it's always easier to get on the latest release of the applications. Right. I wonder just if you can talk briefly about the market dynamics pull versus push. How much of this is coming from your customers really saying we want a cloud solution versus you guys trying to get ahead of the curve and kind of see in the future. And then within that, are there some industries that are just more rapid, more aggressive, and making this move than others? Because you've got a nice kind of scan across industries. A broad industries. base, we do. So uh, on the first point, uh, we, I mean, we, we sell on premise, we sell cloud today. Honestly, it really is based on the customer's needs and requirements. What the customer's motivations are, their capital restrictions, their operating uh, constraints, their own IT infrastructure and resourcing. So from our perspective, a lot of it is around, well, what, what, what's best for the customer at this point in time? So if the customer wants an on-premise solution, we'll give them on-premise. If the customer's ready for the crowd, we, we, we like to push them in that direction because we like the concept of taking away from them all of the hassle of worrying about security, worrying about upgrades, worrying about infrastructure. Uh, so on the first point, you know, pull versus push, I would say that ultimately, you know, for us it's all about what what's best for the customer. Okay. And then on the second point, um, so what's the second yeah, just point? Are there any particular industries across that vast uh, group that you service that are really more uh, aggressive in trying to make this move to a cloud-based infrastructure? You know, I would say that uh, I create a distinction between, I guess, you know, applications like HCM and financials, which are more generic in nature, they're not industry specific, and they've always traditionally been seen as being further, right. easier to put in the cloud, you know, a lot of our payroll, competitors. Right? Payroll, Payroll was yeah. the first one forever ago, and everyone kind exactly. of forgets about ADP. Yeah, <laughs> I I exactly. Um, you know, we're one of the, few, if only companies, to offer the breadth of industry suites in the cloud that we're offering. But within the industries themselves, 
uh, you know, I would say that it, it really is, the interest is coming from across the board. We're seeing interest from defense customers who have to meet ITAR requirements, who've got strong compliance that they need to, to, to make, and our software delivers that in conjunction with Amazon as an infrastructure uh, provider, to HIPAA in healthcare. Um, so it really is across the board. I would not say that there's one which stands out more so than, than the other. We're seeing a lot of interest across all of the industries that we serve today. Pam, I want to ask you about the 70-30 um, rule, which always we've always 70% money and time spent managing the business, 30% spent on innovating the business, and that's been the paradox for IT, getting mm -hmm. out of that. Uh, you mentioned that's really the issue, right? And can you get yep. that 70% flipped around where 30% is on managing and operating and 70% is innovating, yeah. which is driving business line objectives, top line growth, so where are we in that equation? So your announcement really kind of telegraphs that move of the satisfaction, we talked about that, but okay, how are we gonna get that 70% on innovation? Um, and and what makes that enterprise ready for that? Because the argument we're having on Twitter just now is, it's not so much that Amazon's not enterprise ready, it's the enterprise aren't ready themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, so, They're not Amazon ready. <laughs> They're not Amazon ready, or, or cloud ready. So the, the, the requirements for true enterprise cloud are still being baked out, and that's what, that's kind of the public secret that everyone's talking about. So I want to get your take on that. Where is the to-do items? Where's the traction? Where's the solid ground people are building on today? From, from an enterprise vendor from perspective? An enterprise from a vendor and your customers at our enterprises, you know, they want cloud. Everyone kind of says, hey, I want cloud. There's kind of demand for it. But like, what, what version of the cloud or what features are different? The compliance, you have all kinds of weirdness mm -hmm. that, you know, legacy vendors, are not going to just throw away and rip and replace. So this migration, that's the conversation. So, so how ready is the enterprise for an Amazon model? And how ready is Amazon for those environments? Um, I think very ready. Uh, you know, we're seeing from, from our customer, and we've got huge tier one mega customers uh, who literally may choose to start by saying, you know what? Uh, I'm going to open a subsidiary in Singapore. I'm going to open up a plant in some country around the world. Um, you know, I want, to, I want your industry solution because it meets my end-to-end -end business requirements. Let me start there. Let me get a subsidiary up and running fully on SaaS. And once they're comfortable and confident that, you know, that is something that, you know, feasible that they can run their business on, they, they, they expand from there. There's other customers then that are far more aggressive in terms of wanting to go broader across their portfolio. Uh, we, we, we are very ready. We have a very solid, robust, extensive, uh, integrated suite of applications that we deploy today for a customer on premise and what we've spent a lot of time doing over the last 18 to 12 24 months has been to I guess retool and re-architect those applications to make them run as cost effectively and as efficiently in the cloud as possible and that's what that's what our customers want. So do you think the structural changes are it structural barriers or it just is it just evolution it's just a matter of time? I think it's a matter of time. I think that uh, it's moving, I, I've, I think it's been noticeable in recent times that the pace of this is picking up a lot more than before. Uh, I, but I think we're certainly seeing a, an incredible amount of demand now from our customers that we were not seeing before. So I think it's, pick, it's picking up pace at a, uh, at a significant rate to what we were seeing in Before the Jeff gets that question, did you have any trademark problems with Cloud Suite? I mean, that's a pretty nice name. <laughs> I mean, did you have a trademark on that? We are, it was a challenge, <laughs> yes, it was a challenge, uh, for sure, and I, I could tell a lot of stories on that. Which That's worth a cue, we'll save that for your next day, your yeah, next exactly. day. We'll, we'll get those tonight, on, and we're having drinks later. Exactly, right. um, exactly. Great name, love the name, very generic, good, clean name, Cloud Suite. Um, sorry, Jeff, didn't mean to so, so, Pam, you've been in the industry for a while, you were at Oracle for a long time before and before. I wonder if you can kind of take us up a level and, and look at this kind of moment in, in IT history. Because it just seems to be a whole lot of, of convergent things coming together on the infrastructure side, cloud, big data, and, and kind of give us a little of your perspective of what's unique about this particular moment. Uh, when we moved, when I, I moved with uh, you know Charles Phillips, our CEO, uh, three and a half years to Infor, uh, along with two other uh, executives. And when we came to Infor, what we wanted to really do was really be disruptive to enterprise software because we've seen for so long that there was just a lot of staticness in terms of, you know, even the look and feel of applications um, and, and, and how they were used. And so our strategy over the last three years has been to be really disrupting enterprise software and 
going out and doing those innovative and entrepreneurial things that really would make a difference to sort of change the landscape, if you will, of the last 20 years. I think currently we're at a critical point and juncture in enterprise software whereby you're either going to uh, you know, propels the next level or, or, or you're going to get left behind. And I think that's, uh, you know, there's, I won't name some of the competition, but there are some pretty big uh, other SaaS vendors up uh, out there who are growing very substantially. And, you know, our, our view of who our competitors are now are very different to who they were a few years ago. Mm. So I think there's a lot of change happening at the moment. It's very exciting. Um, for me, I think it's been, you know, the, the most exciting juncture that I've, you know, that in a long time shall we say with a lot of changes happening and we want to stay at the forefront of all those changes and continue to be disruptive and and really make a difference in the enterprise industry traditionally seen to be you know not as progressive as as, as some of the consumer yes so what's technologies. been some of the reactions to the, to the announcement you've done today so obviously you talked to a lot of folks press um, are people getting it uh, yeah. What's what's uh, what are some of the comments you've heard? Surprises. Well, it's funny how Charles's comment: friends don't let friends build data centers. Yeah, has we, been that's, we call that out. That's been picked up all picked over the up place. Quite a bit. Uh, uh, kind of called BS on it a little bit, but I like the quote. <laughs> I mean, you know, data centers were going to certainly change. But that brings up a good point. Let's talk about the data centers. So one of the things we first we love the quote, but mm -hmm. you know, data centers are certainly going to change. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be your grandfather's data centers, the old days. Mm -hmm. It's going to be. It might look completely different. It might be more software driven. It might be smaller footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your vision? of the data center in context to the massively exploding cloud frameworks. I mean, you've still seen some origination in the premise, on premise. What's your vision? Um, yeah, I think it's a timing issue. I mean, honestly speaking, I think we're in that phase now whereby there will still be a need, you know, there'll still be a requirement. Customers will have their IT organizations who want to have their on-premise structure. I think it's a timing issue. I think at some point we will definitely get out of that. It's so hard, as you guys know, in today's day and age to keep pace with the changes in technology and infrastructure that is happening all the time. The need to constantly refresh. It's a costly business. And unless you're somebody like Amazon who's in there can operate at scale and can take advantage of that, then it's it's going to be very hard to, to compete. You mentioned costly. I mean, you look at the numbers, the data centers that are being amortized those that clock's going to yeah. expire on that. What the yeah. hell happens next? I know. You know, like, well, you, know you just throw <laughs> it all, all over again. It's, damn. That's 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 the issue, right? You're but, always you're always invested. But the refresh cycles is the interesting paradigm. It's not a rip and replace, but the re refresh cycles are forcing that change, right? So, do you see the refresh cycles getting smaller and smaller? I mean, how do you see those cycles in the current day? In the old days are years. Now it's oh, now it's yeah, it's months. <laughs> months yeah pretty much um, and that's why I think why you know and that, that's the reason why we chose to go to a AWS we didn't want to have to worry about having to build up massive data centers I mean when you've got for us when we're operating in 150 countries around the globe and you've got customers who want to have their data close to them you know European country customers do not want to have their data or by law they have to right? residing yeah. in the US and and you know continue that example throughout the world and it's not only you know data privacy issues it also has to do with you know issues around latency performance um, so you've got to have that global coverage and that global infrastructure and we thought, you know, from our perspective, we're thinking we don't want to get into that game. It's costly to set up data centers all over the world, yeah. maintain it, continuously have to refresh the, the equipment. The compliance alone is a baggage that you don't want. I mean, why would you want to build Absolutely. that out? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, again, that was another core reason why we went with Amazon. And their global scale really matches the global scale in which you know, we most operate. People, most company. people don't talk about that. They talk about it. It's been, it gets talked about, but it's not the sexy item. But if you're a chief operating officer, so you deal with this stuff, the operations side, like, yeah, we've got to be in all these countries. I mean, that's a huge issue. Oh, completely. How big of an issue is it? Explain to the folks out there how complex it is to operate in a multi, as a multinational company. Oh, and I will say even now, I mean, now that we've taken, you know, we are running these cloud suites in the cloud. We're running the infrastructure on behalf of our customers. As a chief operating officer, I am very, uh, attached and, and very involved in essentially how our applications run, how efficiently they run, uh, the infrastructure in which we're running because it's it, we're carrying the cost now. 
um, we've got to make sure that we're as cost efficient as possible and we're keeping our costs as low as possible. So it really, so from, from my perspective, it's been a great uh, way in which, you know, we can make sure that our applications are running as cost effectively as possible so that our on-premise customers also get the benefit of highly effective, flexible, efficient applications. So maybe the coin tweet we should say is Amazon's global as a service business model. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, you're taking advantage of a lot of their their success internationally, right? Footprint. Uh, well, we have, se have 70,000 customers uh, around the globe, uh, substantial amount of customers. You know, we obviously have sales and, and offices all over around the globe. So my point is that though, you know, their global footprint is very similar to ours. There's not that many infrastructure operators out there that have that extensive footprint like we have. So it's so, a pretty good amount. So we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you a little bit of a different question, because like we said at the beginning, Infor is probably the biggest software company that a lot of people haven't heard of. And you guys are private, and, and Michael Dell just took his company back, right? So he's back private. Can you talk a little bit about why you guys are private? Are you going to stay private? Or And you obviously worked at Oracle, big public company. What are the positives, negatives, advantages of being uh, staying as a private company? Yeah, that, that comes up quite a lot. There's not that many $3 billion revenue companies that, uh, that are still private. But being private gives us a huge amount of ability to be really entrepreneurial and to be really disruptive in terms of what we're doing. Uh, we have had tremendous growth. Uh, over the course of the last two years, which is a testimony to the fact that our strategy is resonating with customers. Um, so we're very happy with the growth we've been seeing. You know, we are very financially stable. We generate very good EBITDA all of the time. We have a very strong cash uh, balance. So there is no there is no stress or there is no urgency or need for us to go public. Um, our boards, our sponsors are obviously very financially well backed and they have a very long term vision. Uh, but as always, we will keep an eye on the market conditions and we, the, you know, our board at some point will decide when is the right time for us to go public and at that point in time we'll be ready. But for well, now... Well, Pam, thanks for coming on theCUBE. I think you guys are a great example of Amazon's move to the enterprise, shepherding the big change from on-premise to the cloud. Um, the carrying costs, these, these little things like carrying costs, costs of doing business do affect profitability and the cloud is a economic game changer. So congratulations on your success. Congratulations you. on the feature, feature launch today with Amazon. Uh, we are here inside the Cube. We're live in San Francisco. We'll be back with our next guest after this short break. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick here inside the Cube at Amazon Web Services Summit. <laughs>